All right, let's move on to adoption. Debbie, it's fair to say you come across as almost sounding anti-adoption. Oh, it's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. You come across as almost sounding anti-adoption. And I think when we unravel and, and pick at your ideas a little bit, you're not quite 100%. It, you think it maybe it's got some place. Um, but why don't you tell us the place you observe it It has? And let's talk about Australian culture. Uh, let's talk about what you think adoption looks like in Australia, why that's wrong, and the place it should have. Sure. We don't have a huge, what I would think of as a huge adoption problem in Australia. Um, however, my, my, my awareness raising around adoption began when I began facilitating support groups for, I was already facilitating support groups for post-abortive women who were struggling. And I became interested in the issue of adoption and began facilitating support groups for mothers who had lost children to adoption and uh, for adult adoptees. And I'd already done a couple of years of researching around some of the issues involved. And their stories really cemented for me that adoption is not a happy experience for mothers. It's not a happy experience for those who grow up adopted. Now, I'm not talking for everybody, of course, and I'm not saying it's a blanket terrible thing for all of those people. It does come with huge negatives, huge amounts of trauma. And yet what we hear is that adoption is always this happy, wonderful, lucky um, occurrence. And it provides babies for people who are desperate and they can't have babies, um, which is a whole other issue. Which is beautiful the, for them. Which is beautiful for them. And in the sense that, um, we're ignoring the trauma. We're ign I watch uh, I watch three minute kind of videos let, on let Facebook. Let me ask you um, point yeah. blank: Are you ragging on adoptive parents? Absolutely not. I don't believe for one moment. I, I think all of these issues are issues around abortion. We need to be very, we always have to have compassion for people who are strongly invested in abortion. We have to have compassion for people strongly invested in adoption. I right. don't believe for one moment that adoptive parents have um, attempted to cause trauma or even aware necessarily of the trauma that may occur. Um, and I think that's where I, some I would of go a step further and say they're probably aware of the trauma they've prevented, um, and at least that's that's the perception that there's a whole lot of trauma prevented by stepping in and saying we have space in our home, we have space in our heart, we will love you like our own. Um, Absolutely, yeah. and I agree. I agree that is that that's the sentiment behind it. Mm. Those sentiments being there don't change the reality for many people and many adult adoptees who are now speaking out and saying, you know, I was raised in a lovely family. My parents loved me. I have siblings. I was well educated. I've got a great job. I'm married. I've got children. I would rather have been a than live with the hole oh, in my heart from abandonment. That is not an isolated story that I hear. Oh, that's and tragic. It is, it is a, what that is, is a sign of the depth of pain that's a that lot of can despair. be experienced by someone who's adopted. And, and I guess you're going to say there's a way we can prevent, uh, prevent mitigate or solve that trauma without adoption, without uh, without killing the person at conception? I don't believe that. I, I believe adoption and abortion have to be completely different discussions. I began talking to pro-life. Is that practical? Uh, I, I think it has to be. I think you only have to look at the facts. Uh, this, the, let's, look at, let's just look at numbers, for example. It's one of the three main options if you so don't want to it, kill your baby. In the United States, we have exactly the same abortion rate as the United States per thousand yes. women, for example. Yep. They have many thousands percentage times adoption. Wow. What that tells us is 
if adoption was the solution to abortion, their abortion rate would be a lot lower. And it's it's simply not. Mm. The reason we have less adoption here is is there's probably a few reasons. One is that adoption isn't privatised here. So we don't have lots of people in the middle making lots of money out of adoption and therefore pushing it along in many, many ways, one of which I'd particularly like to address in just a moment. I'd love to see not-for-profits get involved um, to take government and bureaucracy out of it, but without a, without a profit basis. Yes, Okay, I'll come you, back to you that. Go on. Come <laughs> yeah. back to that. The <laughs> other thing is that in Australia, we actually do have a reasonable social security system and and means and, and ways in which women can be supported. You know, we have we have reasonable paid parental leave. In the in the United States, you have women who um, are losing their children to adoption because they can't get any leave from work and they would have to go back to work two weeks after they've had their baby and they have no rent to cover that period of time. So we have circumstances in, in the United... Again, again, this is the United States, not Australia. But there are cer certainly circumstances in the United States where um, it costs upwards of $30,000 to to adopt a baby or what I have called today on Twitter buying a baby um, and most of that money goes into uh, solicitors pockets and the pockets of middlemen. Mm. Um, it costs uh, less than a thousand dollars in according to a couple of grassroots organizations in America one of one is called Saving Our Sisters and they are a group of women who have been impacted by adoption and now do everything they can to help other women not have to go through that um, they say it costs less than a thousand dollars to meet the short-term need of a woman that would otherwise have had her losing her baby to adoption that's huge what that that's tells fair. us yeah. is that um, women's need these are not women who don't want their babies they're not women who are not capable of loving them they're not women who are not capable of raising them however effectively or ineffectively we might choose to judge that as they are women in desperate circumstances who in a country of privatized adoption are preyed upon to provide babies for babyless couples mm. it is an industry over there but, so but what that tells us is it's the same reason women seek abortion that at the other end of pregnancy they end up adopting so I in australia in australia there are current pushes toward more adoption from my perspective they are pushes toward the creation of trauma i would Adopt be one of those people calling for more adoption mm -hmm. uh, thinking and it's a solution to uh help reduce um abortion that i would have thought our culture is simply geared towards ease and convenience rather than the hard road of, of, of finding a home and a solution for a theoretically unwanted baby. Um, so. and, and, I, and I think that's the thing, theoretically unwanted baby. And so as soon as you are someone who looks at women seeking abortion and says, actually, just to have your baby and adopt it out, um, we're, we're immediately undermining all the research we have around why those women are seeking abortion. It's a lack of resourcing. It's often also a push because of our dominant discoursing. They don't have lots of information about um, right. fetal development, about what this baby means to, or would mean to them if they continue their pregnancy. Um, they don't have lots of supports around to say, well, yes, you can continue your education or you can go back to your education or um, mm. actually your boss is not allowed to sack you uh, if you have a baby. So there's, there's a huge amount of pressure and coercion, both direct and indirect, on women toward abortion. I agree with you furiously that the best outcome is for a, a family, uh, first of all, uh, the man involved, uh, second of all, the families involved. And thirdly, the, the immediate community around someone. I'm thinking ideally a church, but for people who don't go to church, then then the community around them, whatever that looks like, of, of saying, we will stand with you, we will support you. Oh, look, fourth layer has to be of, obviously in our welfare kind of society. We're throwing money at everything 
Um, yeah. Why aren't we supporting women, uh, putting our money where our mouth is with choice and support and dignity mm-hmm. and and uh, informed consent and, and things like this? Like, for a start, let's make uh, um, counselling independent, non-financially invested uh, counselling mandatory uh, for anybody who's going to receive taxpayer funding before killing their baby. Uh, mm-hmm. This is surely just a part of informed consent. Um, mm-hmm. And... Yeah, let's go for that. Um, I would never want to see a woman criminalised for any choice she makes, um, but that's probably a, a too big a tangent to pursue. What I do want to see is this cherishing, this support, this gathering around, congratulating and and practically supporting the woman. I love your ideas of how do we make the whole community more welcoming and embracing and, and promoting of motherhood. Um, but, yeah, that... that Obviously, I would love to see every mother keep her child, every child be raised by its married biological parents um, as a first choice wherever wherever possible. And that's not always possible. I, I understand that. But, yeah, I'm in furious agreement that the ideal is for every child to be raised by its biological mother, if not biological married parents. So given what we know then about um, the num- just the p- plain numbers, just the statistics that abortion rates are no different in countries where there is much more adoption. That is uh, food for thought. It, I, I think what that tells us is that these are two completely separate things. And in fact, I would argue that when we say to an abortion-seeking woman, don't have your don't have an abortion. Have your baby instead. And we because there are many many people who are well resourced. This is the messaging. Who are well resourced who will raise your baby and love your baby. We're simply reinforcing the incapacity she already feels. We're not meeting her need. We're not saying right. we will do everything we can for you. And in fact, I think as I mentioned last night, one of the things on a video um, that I watched where. People taught where a pro-life organisation in the United States talked about um, it not being a good idea to talk about adoption as a sidewalk counsellor with people um, uh, considering abortion. Um, some of the language and some of the the concepts that came out of that typify the kind of manipulation that I see, uh, particularly going on in the United States around this issue, which I would hate to happen here. I feel passionately about this at the moment because there's such a push for adoption. And I want pro-life people to get on board and say, actually, no, we're not going to go down that path. We're going to go down a path of family preservation. Because yeah. one of the dilemmas this um, these people had were if I want to stop a woman having an abortion, I want her to connect to her baby. I want her to feel bonded. I want her to know this is her child. However, the problem we then have is that she might become too bonded and not want to gift that baby to someone else. Now, I, I find that remarkable. Find... I, I want to interview the. I know the guys who said that. I want to interview them and say, are you serious? You you don't want the mother to raise her baby? Do you think that's a problem? Like, was that just a misspoken uh, sentiment or I, do you actually yeah. think that's a problem? Yeah, I, I, and I think they think it's a problem, but I think they think it's a problem for the same reason that we have people in our country who are saying, look, who were standing outside clinics when it was when it was legal to stand outside clinics, of course, which is a whole other discussion, um, uh, yeah. saying we'll adopt your baby. We, we're not recognising the message that we're sending. When we say to someone, we're saying she's already there because she feels pressured or coerced or like yep. she do, she's not resourced. And then we say, well, we can see that. You're not resourced. You're not worthy of having that baby. We want mm. to give your baby to someone else. And we're just, you know, we, I would, I would hope argue, they would seriously protest the, that that's what they mean. And I'd give them that credit. I think but, that, and, and uh, yeah, I think that people don't necessarily realise that that's what they meant. My experience of spreading this message, even in the United States, like three days ago, I had a meeting with someone on an executive uh, team for a huge pro-life organisation in America, and they had been watching my work in this area and said, look, actually, I want to start talking to our executive about this. And they wanted more information because they said... I'd never thought of it like that before. And that's what mm. some of the commentary from my talk last night has generated. This is, this is what I applaud in a conversation is like you and I might be both uh, similarly ideologically aligned a whole heap, 
But uh, I'm really, really interested in being proven wrong if I'm wrong because uh, yeah. ignorance is a liability. I don't want it. Uh, relieve me of that burden as soon as possible. Mm. Um, look, I, I do want to take a, an interruption right here and, uh, and just say because it has to be said um, that if you are a post-abortive woman, um, if you're thinking about an abortion, um, I, I don't want you to hear any condemnation uh, from me or, or from anybody. Um, I would hate to have ever been in, in such a difficult position. And I'm aware that most people in, in those positions feel like they have no other choice. So you're not getting any judgment or condemnation uh, from me. Part of um, Sanctity of Life Sunday is uh, this page on the website, um, the community page. If you would like some help, um, there is such a thing as post-abortion trauma, uh, and it's not at all dissimilar to PTSD. Uh, you need professional, clinical, confidential, qualified and free support um, to walk that journey. I know of many, many women, and sometimes decades later, uh, who are dealing with this and they've never told anybody this, thing, this secret they've carried for a long time. Uh, so the first thing is um, head to this page and you will find uh, in your state and, um, and national uh, services which will provide um, qualified professional counselling to help you uh, walk through that, that harm and that trauma uh, in your life. You'll also find support if you are facing an unplanned pregnancy right now and needing genuine, real choices. Um, and you won't be pushed into adoption. Um, if you say clearly what you want, they will just try and give you an informed decision. Um, but I hope that, you know, when I'm calling a spade a spade, um, it's because truth, like I said for myself before, ignorance is a liability. We, we can't talk about this with euphemisms. We have to be realistic. Um, we are taking the life of an innocent living human uh, when we have an abortion. And that's a terrible thing. And, and I would uh, pray for sincere healing and forgiveness and restoration for, for you. It horrifies me when anybody condemns a, a post-abortive woman. Um, so whether you're facing an unplanned pregnancy or you're post-abortive, uh, please know you're you're loved and not judged. And there's just a whole spectrum of, of people's various maturity. So you might get that in some places, but you shouldn't. Uh, what you should get is unconditional support, acceptance and support um, to becoming a whole uh, person and recovering from that trauma. You got anything to add along those lines, Debbie? I mean, have a look at that page if there's any resources missing. Um, sure. that's uh, sanctityoflifesunday.com.au, um, then clicking on the community button. Um, yeah, let us know because, um, yeah, you've got some great perspectives on this. Yeah. Look, and I think I think everything that you said is so important and we all need to be very aware that every time we talk about abortion anywhere, we are likely to be in the hearing of someone who's been directly affected by abortion. And mm. Women who've had abortions are already who, and women who have had abortions and are suffering are already very silenced. There are very few places that they can go and have their mm. experiences validated. Right. Um, Society refuses to let you have closure because if you grieved a dead baby, you have to acknowledge it's a dead baby and not just a clump of cells, which is which is yeah. a, a taboo confession. And there's this, and, and the discourse, the rhetoric of choice, you chose that path. You had choices mm. and you chose it. And women's so choices, women women's choices in so many different areas, uh, you know, often the choice of, you know, one not great thing against another great thing. Um, and we make those choices every day. We, you know, I make them every day. I make them willingly every day. Sometimes I've got to choose between doing something for my husband or for one of my kids when actually I'd rather do something for me. You know, yeah. that's that's a small thing compared to this, but it's the same kind of right. issue. I've I have spoken to I've I've literally spoken to hundreds of post-abortive women over over many years. The last four years, I've been contacted by probably close to 70 women now who have commenced a medical abortion. And we're learning something very, very different from this group of women. Now, a medical abortion necessitates taking two different medications. 
24 to 36 hours apart. And we're seeing something that is occurring to a woman when she takes that first pill, which is mifepristone, and she has a sudden awareness of what she has done. And she wow. has to then take another step. I've been contacted by upwards of 70 of these women over the last four years who become absolutely desperate to now stop the process. We know that these women are lied to when they contact a clinic. We know many of them, their first port of call is to call back at an abortion clinic and they're told, well, you have no choice. You have to continue. Yeah. Mifepristone will cause harm to your fetus. We know the evidence doesn't support that. There's nothing else that you can do. So we're getting, and we're also hearing stories about the coercive tactics that are happening, you know, if, as if that's not coercion enough because it's, it's yeah. missing. Nation. But yep. there's coercion occurring inside clinics. There's coercion occurring when women get home with the mifepristone from partners and boyfriends and mothers. Um, this is giving us a really great, a very unique insight into the psychology of what happens. I've spoken to many dozens of women who say they woke up after their surgical termination and cried and cried and cried and just realised what they'd done and there was no going back. These women who've just taken mifepristone still have an opportunity to at least not take the next step and mm. m and have a small chance that their pregnancies may continue. Um, so, you know, these things are just talking about that, just suggesting Is that Is there women... a reversal pill that will uh, counteract the mifepristone? Mifepristone acts as a, um, for um, in layman's terms, it blocks progesterone, uh, which then causes... Uh, the fetus to die and then misoprostol is taken to cause uterine contractions and um, cause everything to leave the body. Uh, what can happen, there's a huge organisation in America called Abortion Pill Reversal where doctors prescribe progesterone. So they superdose the women with progesterone. Okay. There's been some relatively good success over there. Um, what we need here is we really need a clinical trial um, and there are processes occurring, which I may talk to you a bit later about, where there's some, it, we're in the middle of some processes to take steps toward um, something like that. Uh, so we really need a clinical trial in Australia um, in order to see, does this really work? What is the effect of it? Um, that and sounds really hard to uh, coordinate. And, you, don't and want to, you don't want to uh, you don't want to catalyze that decision to terminate a pregnancy um, for part of a trial. That's ruthless. It's um, yeah. Well, I mean, a clinical trial in this regard would have to involve every woman being able to access progesterone and then measurements against what we know about pregnancy continuation with doing nothing against what might occur with pregnancy continuation in, in the presence of progesterone. So um, it's, it's worthwhile doing because we already know that um, women are seeking help in this regard and they're being misinformed. And I think it's a, it, yeah, it's something that we need to, we need to look that's, at. That's criminal. What it does is really highlight for us the desperation of women at that point, mm. the desperation when they begin to seek abortion and then their desperation when they realise, oh, what have I done? And and that's why that one of the re really big reasons we need to be so compassionate toward women. You know, I yes. think about the fact that, you know, I, I had my first baby at 17 and sh there was a lot of pressure to have an abortion. Wow. If it had been today, when there were many more abortion clinics available, I mean, this was back in 1982, and getting an abortion then wasn't an easy thing to do, even though it was legal. Um, but it, it, I, it was my rebellion that meant I wasn't getting an abortion. I was having a baby. And so, you know, I then had two babies by the time I was 21 and raised them by myself and didn't wow. get married until my mid-30s and then had inherited for beautiful young stepchildren to raise as well. Um, but, you know, in the midst of that, I also got three degrees and then my PhD, now that they've all grown up and gone home, they've never been an interruption to my life. They've been my life. I've never been an adult without being a mother. So to some wow. extent, it's it, there's Good on that you. aspect of me. But I also think we're living in this world, we're all carrying this huge maternal grief 
We're carrying it for the women who've lost babies through miscarriage and stillbirth. We're carrying it through the women who've had abortions. We're carrying it through the women who've lost babies to adoption. Mm. And it's almost palpable to me and hearing and feeling that grief. And, you know, in... In our maternity is our greatest strength. You know, you think about a mother protecting her child. Is there yes. any more anything more, um, you know, strong and courageous and capable? And what would right. you not do for your child? Mm. That's also our point of greatest vulnerability. Um, and I see that particularly when mm. I've spoken to women who've had terminations, when they've had a diagnosis of a fetal anomaly, or they're told their baby may have Down syndrome or um, won't survive birth or would have a terrible quality of life. And what that taps into, many women have abortions in those circumstances because what they get is practice doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor often repeatedly throughout the pregnancy tell them that termination is the most compassionate thing to do. So you don't want your baby to suffer. These are not women selfishly having abortions because they don't want their babies. These are women whose strength of motherhood is being manipulated at her point of greatest vulnerability, which is that mm -hmm. love for their child in order to do the most compassionate thing and to her detriment. So we use this in very negative ways um, to manipulate mm. women. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, it's it, it, we need to begin to really value and highlight what comes with being a woman and being a mother and what that means. Um, yeah. And letting women know it actually, yeah, of course it's hard and of course it makes you more vulnerable. And yes, there might be a period of time when you might have to rely on your husband's salary while you choose to stay home and raise kids, but that's actually okay. Um, yeah. There are no, I'd, all like, these... I'd like to see a lot more promotion of that as a honourable choice. Yeah, you know, and we, but, and we forget that vulnerable isn't weak. You know, vulnerable is, you know, it's not a weakness. It, it can be a strength. And I think women have that in abundance and we've lost sight of that yeah. um, for ourselves and we've certainly lost sight of it as a society. Debbie, um, how should adoption laws be improved? Processes, procedures, bureaucracies and legislation. Um, I, I'm aware there's a variation. If you can give us the differences between states, that that's great because I really don't know the differences sure. between states. So I've heard New South Wales is leading the way, but what's your opinion? Lay of the land, what can we do better across all of those facets to doing it? Yep. I think the first thing that would need to change for a, a, there are there are going to be times when a child cannot live with their family of origin for a, for a number of reasons. And therefore, a child needs to be in a long-term, loving, stable home for life. I don't believe that has to occur by way of adoption, which, as it exists in every state at the moment, that it necessitates an erasure of their, their identity. So all links to their biological family are removed. Their legal links, their inheritance, right, inheritance rights, often the contact with family. People mm -hmm. often talk about open adoption being the way forward and how wonderful that is, but except open adoption comes with its own issues as well. Firstly, it's not the um, thing that people often envisage, and that is that the mother is very engaged and comes along for birthdays and Christmases and the child gets to see her all the time. Open adoption can be as, as minimal as the child has the opportunity to know who their mother is when they turn 18. Phone contacts when they turn 18. I would have thought it was... I thought it was as minimal as knowledge of. Um, might not necessarily be life involvement, but simply, certainly, no erasure of identity. These are your parents, and um, as as soon as the parents raising you uh, feel you mature enough to handle that, uh, it's never a secret from you, but... Um, yep. Yeah, it's yep. never a secret. That's probably what I thought it was. And think about that. Even that double-edged sword. I was talking to an adult adoptee last night. I've had quite a few people contact me after um, after the panel. And, um, awesome. you know, you think about how um, we must tell children that they've been adopted. They have, they have the right to truth. 
they are always then the adopted child. They're not, you know, people don't adopt a child and that child becomes, is theirs. Uh, that's not how it happens. They are the adopted child. They're always labelled the adopted child. They may be labelled the lucky child. We chose you. Implicit in that is we can unchoose you. Implicit in that is your own mother didn't choose you. These are the underlying messages that come through all the time. The other, the other problem we have at the other end for adult adoptees, and one that was very strongly put to me um, last night, and I had a couple of messages this morning, is that an adult adoptee, someone who was adopted as an infant, has no right to reverse that adoption to then become the legal child of their biological mother should they choose to. So I, t I think I touched on this at the panel. A 16-year-old in some states in our country can mm. have their gender changed by writing a stat deck. You know, mm. their gender, <laughs> you know, they may maintain biologically. Um, which, which isn't a good practice. That's that's No, of course not. Ignorant. Of course not. Um, mm. However, we have a situation here where a contract is undertaken. Adults sign over a human being from one family to another um, and say, this, this human being now belongs in your family. When that human being grows up and has rights of their own, they can't discharge that contract. They can't, even if they're then alienated from their adoptive family, even if they've then developed a relationship with their biological uh, mother, they cannot reverse that contract without huge expense. It has to go through the courts. It's not always successful. That's wrong. Um, it, that's wrong on many, many levels. Uh, and it, it how would you do it? To... I, I'm not sure I agree, but mm -hmm. how would you do it differently? I think, well, adult adoptees tell me that they should be able to simply do it as a matter of contract law, just the same as just the same way I was traded as an infant into a family, I should be able to sign myself cynical, back out of that. Awfully cynical it's, choice of words. It's their lived experience. And it doesn't make it objectively true. It, it can be a feeling. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't mean to dismiss their lived experience, but I, I don't want to overweight it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, look, I, and, and I, get, I guess my, I guess. Let me declare my bias. My my perspective is my understanding of adoption is somewhat biblically informed, and not the Australian context. Uh, and that was essentially because the Bible calls us adopted sons of God, um, and and that is not. <laughs> I mean, there's certainly some accounting references in that transaction. You know, we're we're reconciled, our, our sins are paid for, we're redeemed. Um, but but it's a picture of of the society in which that language was was chosen was um, ancient Israel, ancient Rome, and in in Rome, um, it when uh, when a Roman family adopted a son or daughter, um, you weren't the adopted child; you were their child, as if you had sure identity erasure. You're saying is a problem. But they're saying that concept in that time was you were never anything else. Um, you've always been. You are absolutely in every aspect um, equal to every one of my children, full, full everything. Um, and and that's a you know that's intended to be a positive picture for the communication of the relationship that Father God wants to have with us. Um, it, and and so I, I'm coming at it from a very positive, beautiful way. Like, um, and I understand that lots of people, if not the vast majority of, of adoptive adults and adolescents, really have a sense of missing identity, um, and and that should be serviced. That should be cared for and, and catered to in in whatever we consider modern adoption now. Um, I actually know some adopted adults who uh, don't want to know anything. They act, they actually embrace the erasure of their old identity, um, and and I accept that that's not the majority experience or majority testimony. But mm -hmm. um, I find it fascinating because I think it's counterintuitive to me. I would want to know my medical history and and my cultural history um, of both sets of parents. To be fair. Um, but, um, I, yeah, so 
I don't know, is there anything in there you want to push back on or reflect on? Yeah, I think I I I don't want to I, I don't want to discuss the the biblical foundation of adoption. Sure. It, it's is, not overly is, relevant. And and it's and it's not relevant to the people who are living a different experience. Although I understand it's a foundation uh, on just, which people build a, an understanding. Right. It, it's it's yeah. where I'm yeah. starting and, from. Yeah, and I, I think part part of the dilemma for for these adult adoptees is not that it's not that they they don't not love their adoptive parents. They love their adoptive parents, of um, and that's part of the dilemma that creates an even bigger conflict. They don't want to hurt their adoptive families, and in fact, for some, when they start to talk about wanting to know their biological family they may get pushback from their adoptive parents or maybe some other people in the family. Oh, you don't want to hurt your mother and father and do that. Yeah. Yeah, um, really you know, so, so there are those huge things, but these are huge identity issues, huge, huge, huge identity issues that are underpinned by the trauma of separation um, often at birth for many of these people. So we have to think about what we know, even looking at the science of what we know about what babies learn in utero. And the thing they most learn is who their mother is. When babies are born, we know that when they're separated from their mother, we can measure physiological stress occurring in them that is only alleviated by contact with their mother, not mm. contact with a stranger, not contacted with a nurse who picks them up in the NICU, not contact with a new adoptive mother who is going to love them as her own alleviated by contact with the person whose voice they know, whose smell they know. Mother and baby are a unit. After, mm. after baby is born and separating them creates a trauma that many can't then reconcile as they get older. I've spoken to one post, uh, one adult adoptee who said, you know, from the age of, she remembers as young as the age of two or three that she used to pack a little suitcase to go home to her real family. And oh. she wasn't in a bad family, but she just remembered she didn't quite really, she, she just knew she didn't quite really belong where she was. It was innate for her. So we're not talking about an adult who grows up and says, actually, this sucks, it wasn't for me. We're talking about someone who's carrying wounds from birth, you know, from that very first separation that become yeah. very difficult to heal. Sometimes they find their biological mother and they can be further rejected. Sometimes they find her and discover that really she didn't want them or she was really coerced to let them go. And that adds a whole other layer of trauma for them that, you know, my mum actually wanted to keep me, but she couldn't. Or they discover their biological mother and while they really want to be part of her life, her life is not quite the life they've grown up with. They may have had a more economically advantaged life and their mum is still living in housing commission and maybe drinks a bit too much or something. They're kind of looking and going, actually, right. we're, but I, I want this person, but I don't want that life. And what does that make me as a person? The dilemmas are huge. And I think we need to do everything we possibly can to avoid them. We don't have to, with adoption, we do not have to erase the identity of people if we cannot raise a child and love them and give them a strong, stable, secure home without having to legally own them by, by, by producing a new birth certificate, by denying them contact with, our bio, with their biology, then we're not doing it in the child's best interests. Um, I think that's always got to be the guiding principle and, and I don't know anybody that disagrees. Maybe it's a motherhood statement, um, which is easy to give lip service to. Um, one of the things that concerns me is uh, what looks to me to be like an abusive delay or even fear of adoption uh, in the foster care system where we have children who are bounced around foster homes, um, which are sometimes abusive. Uh, and I have friends who were raised in the foster system and their instinct when faced with an unplanned pregnancy uh, was... Uh, I can't raise this child. I'm too young or too poorly resourced or, or whatever. Um, and so um, I want to consider adoption. And when they went down that road, the government told them, well, we're not going to help you at all through pregnancy. You just have to have the baby by yourself. Then the first step is to put the child in foster care on the path to 
adoption. Uh, just there was no conversation after the word <laughs> foster care. She's like, no, nah, I would rather abort my baby uh, than have it go through the same kind of childhood that I did. Um, so one of the things we've got to fix is, uh, you know, the lack of support for a mother who wants to give her child life, um, just washing your hands of and making it really, really hard. Uh, the second thing we have to do is is say, well, look, why, you know, if, if a kid's going to be bounced around foster care for their entire lives, surely this is meant to be a temporary system. If uh, I think there needs to be a hard time limit, and I think two years. If a parent is proved um, unable to, and obviously right now the the family services uh, different departments are trying to help and resource parents. I think they're trying too long. I don't think you can try too hard, but I think they're trying for too long. Um, and quite often where you've got parents who are just refusing to be rehabilitated from substance abuse and child abuse, I think, you know, after two years, there's too much of this child's precious formative years um, that are being exposed to uh, toxic environments, if not outright abuse. Um, and they need to be given for their own sense. Of, look, ideally, it would be with their biological parents. But in these cases, ideal just isn't going to happen. And so what's then in the best interest of child is, is a permanent home. And so my argument is the same. We don't, it doesn't have to be adoption. If there is a problem with the foster system, if there is a problem with how we're screening foster parents, if there is a problem with children going from family to family to family, which is very unstable for them, let's fix that system. We don't have to um, replace it with adoption. Uh, what we what we can we we can provide long term guardianship for children that doesn't take away their history that doesn't re remove their other rights that still keeps parents involved however inadequate we make them feel it really concerns me when we fall into a position of saying um, you know a couple has two years to get their act together and or a mother has two years to get her act together and then someone decides what that looks like now let me tell you why that bothers me from for one reason mm. that i was a 17 year old mother there is no my my daughter is a paramedic she's a mother of four children she's beautiful my kids have all, all grown up lovely and successful and happy more or less most of the, most of the time um however i was a 17 year old mother now, I, at a time... Did you time, have community services saying you're an unfit mother and raising I serious certainly, concerns? I certainly was <clears throat> aware, retros, in retrospect, aware that I was watched. At any point in time, someone could have decided I wasn't being a good enough mother. And I'm sure there were times I wasn't being a good enough mother. I was 17. Um, and yeah, but it, I'm not talking about, you know, humanity and no parents are perfect and... and I'm not talking about moments where you really stuff up as a parent, and mm -hmm. that's going to happen maybe a little bit more often at 17. But I'm talking about where you're, you know, uh, I don't know what the, the right word is. I don't want to use too, too I don't want to use hyperbole, but you just pathologically, consistently, mm -hmm. always having your kids taken off you because of abuse after abuse after abuse uh, of substance or them. Um, and, you know, that's... That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a 17 And I do think there needs to be a certain mother. time at which we say, there, there does need to be a certain time at which we're, we have to say, look, we can't keep doing this to these children. What I'm saying is adoption doesn't have to be the answer to that. What I'm saying is, you know, long-term guardianship that puts these children in a stable home that does still allow safe connection to their biological parents it continues to be important. And let me interrogate some words you're using. Uh, you, you've, um, you've expressed concerns with calling the child the adopted child as, as if that's a, a less than thing. Don't you think that adoption gives them some sense of identity and permanency, whereas permanent guardianship is even less permanent, more diluted again, less wanted and and uh, to me it sounds less permanent and less um like you are part of this family if per if permanent guardianship is permanent then it's permanent they already have an identity why do they need a new identity 
Why well, do they need to have a new birth certificate produced? Because you, you're not just saying you're an adopted part of this family. It sounds like you're saying you're not part of this family. Your identity is part of another family. To me, that sounds worse. So I wonder how that would be different. And it, it is a bit different. And I wonder how that's a bit different from step parenting, for example. So I raised four stepchildren. I would argue vehemently that I love my stepchildren you know, to the nth degree. Two of my stepchildren I've known since they were born because I was involved in the lives of their parents for many years prior to wow. later on mm -hmm. marrying. Mm. Um, so I, lo I love them. I am not their mother. Even though I have played a huge mothering role, I feel like I'm their mother, like I'm the mother to my children. They would, you know, a couple of them at least, you know, on most good days would argue that I have been, you know, exactly the same as a mother to them, but I am not mm. their mother. Their mother is their mother. And I have never, comparison. I've never worked to usurp that role in any way and nor would I, but I've had no legal rights. I could not at any time, even when they were minors, if my husband had died, I'd have no legal rights to those children. It hasn't changed how I am with them, hasn't changed how I love them or would support them, or they are in a loving, stable, lifelong relationship with me, regardless of anything else. It is possible to do it for children and it is possible for adults to do it if they have the children's interest at the forefront as opposed to their own. I, I think, um, yeah, I think you're more right than you're wrong. Um, that I, start. I <laughs> it is. Um, yeah, I, I'm with you is the short answer. Um, I, I don't know that adoptive, I think if we change our understanding of adoption, uh, we'd probably solve most of your concerns. Um, uh, I don't know that I'm convinced that the new identity is a problem. Uh, I think it's making the best of a bad situation um, where where adoption is necessary um, or, or thought the best option. Um, I, I think being able to call, you know, I, the difference between stepmum and, and foster mum uh, is interesting, but the difference between stepmum and mum which is the name of an adoptive mother, um, is I think stabilizing and and very helpful uh, for a child who needs a permanent sense of identity, uh, and and at the same time I'm not saying I'm not advocating an erasure of their old identity. That mm -hmm. should definitely be part of the narrative they're raised with. You have two families, um, but I am your mum and you are my son. You are my child. Um, this is permanent, eternal. There's nothing that will ever change this. I think any language less than that is um, is is less than ideal. And uh, my experience is that could happen if we put the children's interests first without yes. adoption as it currently is. My stepchildren okay. know <clears throat> I am as much their mother as their mother, but it's different. There's no question it's different. Um, and that they're lifelong for me. No, that's I think not that's going easier. to end. I, I, think it's, I think it's not a perfect metaphor. Um, I, I have not. family members who are step parents, and, and I think that's, that's definitely a sense of more permanency than the average foster parent. Um, I think fostering, fostering is a whole different system. You know, fostering is not a, a sense of permanence, and we do need to do something to stop, to ensure that people are appropriately screened to be foster parents and that, um, and that there does become a sense of permanence for children. Absolutely, children can be harmed by being in and out of the foster system. What mm -hmm. my argument is that adoption isn't the answer to that permanent removal and a change of identity and no contact with biology is not the answer to that. And I'm taking my cue. Sometimes from, it's necessary. I'm taking my cue from no. adult adoptees that identity is paramount, that mm. for them, their identity is something that's really important. And, and for and those who want their, to... 
original identity, not their correct. Not their and for those identity. who want to discharge an adoption that occurred for in their world was a transaction of them as a person from one family to another, they can't even reverse that as an adult. That is a huge infringement on their rights. I may be being unfair here, but I'll be honest and, and admit admit it. I, I think if that's the impression a child's been left with, there's been an inadequacy of, of the real communication of relationship um, from the adoptive parents. If they feel that the process of coming into their parents, their adoptive parents' family was transactional. Uh, like, and I guess, that's how, I guess that's just how they look at it. You know, I had another question today about donor conception. You know, women talking about, I'd like to donate my eggs. And I've directed them to a site where donor conceived children talk about the fact that they, they, were, they were commodities. They were transacted. I agree. They were transacted no different from how adult adoptees feel they were transacted. They were simply transacted after birth. I, I now, if you don't, if you, and they're worlds apart to you, they're not worlds apart to the adults who are living the experience. And I think that's what's really important. They're not getting a voice, and we are not listening to that voice when and if they get to express it. And I think we do need to listen to it. Yeah, uh, I just yeah, I, I'm not dismissive of of their experience or perspective, but um, I think it's clear commodification when you create a a person deliberately in that situation to fill an adult need um, as opposed to the coincidence of an adult need um, coinciding with with the uh, any already existing um, minors need um, I don't think that's anywhere near the same level of commodification um, I think that's that's just human solutions but that might be uh, a little bit uh, too far out into the arbitrary perspective <laughs> kind sure. of philosophy realm. But uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, thought to have. Um, so uh, are there any other topics or aspects of this we should cover off before we wrap it up? Um, probably not anything that won't launch us into another hour at this point, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, give us a hint. Maybe we should make it a part two and uh, invite... invite um, the viewers to demand more or not. Yeah, what, sure. what else Look, do you think there is to yeah, cover I, off? I, I, I think this does, you know, just thinking about the donor conceived uh, issue again, you know, we're talking, it, it, they're all kind of working together and, you know, artificial reproductive technologies and what that says to um, women about maternity and about identity and and about the transactional nature of, of what we're doing with human beings, whether it be adoption or eggs or sperm or all of those things I think are really important and they're all indicative of how we're failing to value family and we're trying to control that which shouldn't be controlled um, you know, in terms of fertility and reproduction, and we're trying to mess with something. Sometimes I think we're trying to mess with it because we're scared of the power of it. You know, when something is so hugely powerful, we want to find ways to control it and manipulate it so that it doesn't overcome us. Um, so I think there's a lot, lots more discussion around those issues. And I, I think they all link very well together. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, you can find uh, Dr. Debbie Garrett on Twitter at uh, Debbie Garrett. Um, that's her right there. Uh, let me see, where's the top of it? Yep, Debbie Garrett, double R, double T. And um, she has got some information. She's got links to her website there and uh, some interesting conversations in her timeline as well. Uh, now, Debbie, I'm going to hold you to this. I need those ideas to put on the community page of the Sanctity Absolutely. of Life Sunday. Yep. Uh, great. What what a great way to promote encourage um, motherhood. The the value of life is is so paramount to all of our other rights and and freedoms. Uh, it has to be cherished and honoured and, and promoted in a very positive, proactive, wholesome, non condemnation, non activist kind of way. What can we all of us do? Just say, hey, life, motherhood, these are beautiful things. We need to celebrate and support. Uh, with every available energy and resource together uh, and not just leave it to the government to do because goodness knows there's all kinds of uh, problems when government is our only solution to problems. Yes. Uh, but anyway, 
that's uh, that's definitely a, a long conversation. Yeah, uh, Debbie, I really appreciate your your time and your expertise. Thank you for doing all this uh, research and um, fearlessly challenging the dominant narratives. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Thanks so much for the opportunity to reach more people. I think it's great. Thank you. Awesome, my pleasure. Well, that's uh, Dr. Debbie Garrett, and as I said, you can find her at twitter.com slash Debbie Garrett, double R, double T. And uh, as I said, if you didn't, at the beginning of this show, if you haven't seen uh, what she had to say on the live panel shows on Tuesday night, just two days ago before this video was recorded um, on the 12th of May, uh, then uh, please check it out. Um, there's very, they're very good um, conversations, which which got a lot of follow-up communi communication to Debbie personally, but also to me of people just saying uh, live and after the show how much they really appreciated uh, the clarity and fresh perspective of her thoughts on adoption, um, and that's really good. So if you want more Pillow Talk, uh, subscribe to updates on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, all at Dave Pello. You can also head to my website, davepello.com, where you'll get interviews like this and articles and uh, you'll be able to also support um, and always thank you to the Pello Talk partners who uh, just dip into their pockets a small amount each month to continue making this possible to do, to continue giving you the interviews and information and perspectives that you're not going to get on Australia's national broadcaster or much else of the mainstream media. But uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, I look forward to seeing you in the comments. Time for us to do something. Na, 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 na.